Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Philosophy Hour of Literary Tales. I'm your host, Paul Krauss, and in this episode, we complete Rousseau's Discourses on Inequality by turning to the second discourse and finishing the overview of Rousseau's influential and revolutionary treatise. Rousseau's second discourse on inequality builds from his first, which we've already done an episode on, and that you would be wise to listen to before listening to this assessment and overview of the second discourse. The second discourse contains his famous depiction of the noble savage, which we referenced in our first episode, how man loses his freedom and equality through the establishment of property and society, and his ruminations, and how reason and rationality corrupts human living, and how knowledge is used as a tool of oppression and violence over others. The second discourse is Rousseau's telling of the story of the enslavement of man, which was the task before him in explaining the origins of inequality which his discourses set out to achieve. The second discourse begins with Rousseau's secular depiction of the fall of man. The first man who, having enclosed the piece of land, though of saying this is mine, and found people simple enough to believe him, was the true founder of civil society. For Rousseau, civil society is not founded on a social compact in the manner by which Hobbes, Locke, and Spinoza, and the other early Enlightenment philosophers described it. Rather, civil society is the product of force and coercion, primarily as it relates to property, as the Second Discourse goes on ad nauseum explaining. But this theme of civil society being premised on the rule of force is also a theme that he highlights in his later work, The Social Contract. It is the bedrock of how Rousseau understands what we call liberalism. Here we must pivot briefly into a proper understanding of political philosophy. Rousseau does not target quote-unquote conservatism. His target is the materialistic, utilitarian, and property-oriented statism of the classical liberals. Bacon, Hobbes, Locke, Spinoza, etc. Yet, at the same time, Rousseau is seen as an important liberal thinker, someone who, threw, who saw through the shallow and hollow liberal proclamations of freedom and equality, but did little to actualize and manifest these ideals. Like with the social contract, Rousseau's task is to actualize the liberal ideas of freedom, equality, and an asocial atomism rather than merely pretend. Yet, like the liberals he also deplores, he holds to many enlightenment presuppositions. Man is not a social or communitarian animal, neither is he a cultural animal as Catholic anthropology asserts. Man is, in a way, separated from nature, just as Bacon says, insofar that nature does not impose itself as a barrier to man's self-preservation but necessarily in the strictly conflictual way described by Bacon, Hobbes, and Locke. Man's freedom and equality is the ability to exert himself in motion for consumption, self-preservation, without any barriers imposed on him from outside forces, whether they be from nature or other humans. Rousseau's free and equal man is the result of his independence from others, Man is, according to Rousseau, asocial, though he is amiable. This is something that is shared with other Enlightenment thinkers, like Hobbes and Locke. As already established in the first discourse, man is conceived as fundamentally good, moved by pity and the reflection of the common self in the suffering of others. He even goes as far as to say family is not a natural bond, something that is shared by other Enlightenment thinkers, because people are enslaved to families, dependent upon them up to a certain age, whereby they take leave of their family, being able to survive on their own, 
thus a return to the original state of nature, thus so showing that family is an arbitrary construction. Though this is peculiar because Rousseau in the social contract argues that man is born free but found in chains. Yet if man is born incapable of feeding and clothing himself and dependent upon mama and papa, is not man born enslaved and then becomes free once he accrues the faculties of power to survive on his own? This is an argument and a question that many critics of Rousseau have latched upon. The law of self-preservation leading to man engaging in the martial virtues and the physical exercises necessary to survive is the emergence of man's individual pursuit of his life. Here is Rousseau's peculiar and hard to understand view of the nature of martial virtue. Martial virtue is good when it is done individually. It is bad when it is done at a societal level where a clique, an oligarchy, or a group exert their power over others. It is not so much that martial virtue is bad in of itself, it is that it can be wielded for harmful negative ends. Again, you see this tension in Rousseau when he praises the martial virtue of Sparta, but he does so because it is done in an equal, egalitarian manner. He accosts the idea of martial virtue and strength and coercion when it is done to enhance the lives of only a few people at the expense of others. Rousseau makes clear, however, that the noble savage that man is in the original state of nature is not one in which he is engaged in the spirit of conquest. He lives in nature and coexists with others in healthy martial competition. Only when man becomes experienced, rational, and knowledgeable does the relationship begin to change. By using tree branches as tools and weapons, Rousseau sees man transforming into a brute who sees competition from animals and the barriers and posed over him by nature as something he must overcome through use of force. Rationality corrupts man and turns him into a devil. They lived as free, healthy, good, and happy men, Rousseau writes, so far as they could be according to their nature, and they continued to enjoy among themselves the sweetness of independent intercourse. But from the instant one man needed the help of another, and it was found to be useful for one man to have provisions enough for two, equality disappeared, property was introduced, work became necessary, and vast forests were transformed into pleasant fields which had to be watered with the sweat of man, and where slavery and misery were soon seen to germinate and flourish with the crops. This is important to understand in Rousseau's depiction of the state of nature. The noble savage does not knowingly harm nature or intend to harm nature. He lives with nature and nature provides for man's self-preservation. Following the rise of reason, experience, and knowledge, the creation of tools and technology, Man transforms his relationship with nature and begins to abuse nature, as Rousseau says in the preceding passage I just read from. In this transformation of man's relationship to nature, becoming the coercive master of it through use of tools, man imposes the first structure of inequality over others, which becomes the basis of civil society, private property. All of these evils, Rousseau says, are the main effects of property and the inseparable consequences of nation inequality. Anyone familiar with Karl Marx will see Rousseau's influence over Marx here. In becoming dependent on property and others, man lost his freedom and equality in the state of nature and became subjugated to others 
through the rise of human reason and science. Dependence and science leads to subjugation. Those who have tools, those who have better tools, are the ones whom we end up subservient to. According to Rousseau, property is the foundation of man's coercive hierarchy and binaries. The separation of the sexual division of labor begins because of property. Woman is enslaved to the household property which is owned by men. The coercion of landowners and land workers is the result of property, whereby this relationship of rich landowner and poor worker spirals down and exhausts itself into slavery. Nevertheless, Rousseau also tells us that the new condition in which man finds himself offers him a simplistic and leisurely life. This is something desirable and good, but is the result of the ills of private property. Is Rousseau in contradiction with himself yet again? He notes the paradox of happiness found in this new condition. People were unhappy in losing them without being happy in possessing them, he writes. Does property bring man leisure, which is good, or does it bring domineering structural inequality, like the rest of the discourse claims? If we recall, Rousseau thinks before the advent of private property, man looked upon his fellow man with pity and compassion, because in the strenuous labors of others, he saw the strenuous labors he himself had to do in order to live. While not bonded together, nor seeking to be bonded together, man was amiable with others in their encounters in the state of nature. This is what Rousseau wants to return to. The advent of private property, the possession of land and natural resources needed for self-preservation through the use of coercive logic are bad. Yet, at the same time, leisure, which is a result of the acquisition of property and tools, is something good. The problem isn't leisure. The problem is private property. If we attain leisure through private property and coercion, this is bad. If we have leisure because we enjoy the work that we have just accomplished, that is good. Before private property, all property, if we are to use that term, was public property. The earth was free to all, and to all it gave itself. We shared it with others, with animals, and did not kill or exploit others to utilize it. This is what Rousseau wants to restore with all the benefits of modern technology now given to us. Through a return to common property and the equal division of labor, rather than the unequal division of labor, we will once again be free and equal in relationships, and all will be able to enjoy the leisure that we now have. Quite the rosy picture, isn't it? Rousseau, interestingly, gives us a depiction of how the advent of property moves man from freedom to inequality, to servility, and slavery. It is actually the very opposite of Marx's reading of history, though this is because Marx, coming after Rousseau, thought Rousseau had it backwards. For Rousseau, capitalism, private property ownership, and the power found in material possession actually is the first epoch of history rather than in the middle. And that is the society that is separated into the rich, the landowner, and the poor, the land worker. From there, history regresses into the rule of the strong, the landowner, now backed by the power of political institutions which defend property and possession over the weak who toil for the benefit of the strong under the, thumb of political, uh, under the thumb of political oppression. We would call this feudalism. The dialectic of strong and weak finally exhausts itself into slavery. Whereas in Marx, we move from the original state of primitive communism, the state of nature, into slavery, slavery to feudalism, feudalism to capitalism, and capitalism supposedly into socialism and eventually into communism, we see the reverse in Rousseau. The first epoch of history is capitalism, the creation of private property, from which competition and exploitation results to feudalism, and from feudalism we move into slavery. One of Rousseau's additional comments in the Second Discourse that may sound familiar to many 
is his view that political institutions and structures, while being oppressive, are constituted and instituted by the landowning classes. Government is established by the rich for the rich. This is why government is illegitimate. It does not serve the general will, according to Rousseau. Furthermore, Rousseau is routinely countering the state of nature theories of Hobbes, Locke, and Spinoza. Where the classical liberals tell us the state of nature is a state of war, where life is dominated by fear and violent death, and civil society is a state of peaceful coexistence, Rousseau offers the exact opposite picture in the Second Discourse. Rousseau's state of nature is peaceful tranquility, where civil society is the state of war through competition, clouded over us by the idea of public law. As he explains, man seeks glory and praise from other men, thus enslaving one another to dependence. He seeks glory for his own happiness, and now he is dependent upon the glory of others for that happiness. Those who must glorify are subjected to the glory seeker's power. The property owners, who seek to be happy in material things, learn to gain pleasure from dominating others. As Rousseau writes, the rich, for their part, had hardly learned the pleasure of dominating before they disdained all other pleasures, and using, and using their old slaves to subdue new ones, they dreamed only of subjugating and enslaving their neighbors. The dream of civil society is the subjugation of all others to serve the benefactors and controllers of industry and property and the law. We simply hide the fact that civil society is a war of conflict and enslavement by calling it the rule of law. Moreover, Rousseau articulates the view that private property, again, is not a natural right. Unlike Locke, Rousseau separates property from self-preservation. In Locke, property is the natural continuation of the spirit of self-preservation. Thus, in Locke and in Lockean logic, property is an extension of self-preservation. Self-preservation is not premised on owning anything, only consuming something, according to Rousseau. Thus, Rousseau is able to separate self-preservation from property. Rousseau believes ownership claims are a display of power and force that is contrary to the law of self-preservation through consumption. Rousseau also outlines the first iteration of his general will theory he more acutely develops in his famous social contract. Again, for Rousseau, the social compact is not a contract for property ownership as Locke suggests. Rather, it is a compact to maintain human freedom and equality as the forces of history conspire to move man away from his noble though savage early existence. As Rousseau writes, the people having on the subject of social relations united all their wills into a single will, the general will, all the articles on which that will pronounces become so fundamental laws of obligatory and obligations on every member of the state without exception. And one of these laws regulates the choice of powers of the magistrates charged to watch over the execution of the others. This power extends to everything that can maintain the constitution of freedom and equality without going so far as to change it. The social contract, the real social contract, which he outlined in his work of that title, is about preserving the constitution of freedom and equality that man enjoyed in the state of nature. Liberals, Rousseau claims, being sophists at heart, use the language of liberty and equality, but actually only entrench further inequality and strip away liberty from the many and increase power and liberty in the hands of the few. The last important contribution laid out by Rousseau in the Second Discourse is the legitimate use of physical violence when it is an expression of the general will against the corrupt powers that begin to serve their own self-interest, thus abrogating and abdicating 
that social contract of equality and freedom that caused their existence in the first place. If you can kill the despot, you are permitted to do so because the despot is in violation of the social contract agreement, which the general will manifests itself to correct. The insurrection, Rousseau writes, which ends with the strangling or dethronement of a sultan is just as lawful an act as those by which he disposed the day before of the lives of property of his subjects. Force alone maintained him. Force alone overthrows him. Thus Rousseau contributes to what we call revolutionary theory in politics. Revolution is justified whenever the despot, the ruler, the social contract abdicates its responsibility. Rousseau's understanding of revolution is fundamentally different from Locke. According to Locke, the right to revolution is to restore the social contract that the rulers or the legislators have abandoned in their abdication of upholding the social contract. Rousseau, however, goes a step further. In seeing force rather than illegitimacy as in Locke, as the result of the movement into slavery and inequality, it is only force and force alone that can restore us to the original freedom and, any, and the original freedom and equality that we shared in the state of nature and that the social contract is supposed to uphold. Thus, only force in destroying the social contract is the way we achieve freedom and equality. There is no movement to the courts. There is no petitioning of the law in Rousseau. Force and force alone is what restores freedom and equality. The two discourses on inequality that Rousseau presents to us ought to, found, ought to sound familiar to modern readers. Society is corrupt and is a giant power pyramid which is ruled by force. The group that rules over society is the property-owning class. Rationality and logic are tools of oppression and subjugation used by the ruling class and their philosophical defenders who are employed in science. Private property is not a natural right. Physical use of violent force to overthrow despots who do not act in accord with the general will and the social compact is permitted. The idea that society and civilization is the problem of human existence, the idea that all society is a dialectic of power struggle, and the idea that rationality is oppressive is Rousseauian in nature. It comes from the theories of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. The postmodernists of recent fame owed more to Rousseau than they did to Marx. While it is true that aspects of Rousseau influence Marx, Marx breaks with Rousseau on many important issues. Marx, for one, was an analyst of capitalism and industrial economic systems. Rousseau was a critic of society and everything else that was encapsulated in society. Rousseau was a critic of civilization. For Rousseau, society, civilization, is the superstructure of slavery. The basis of this superstructure is private property. The origins of inequality, unfreedom, and dependence are rooted in private property, tools, and science. Property ownership emerged from the first display of coercive force over others, enhanced subsequently by the use of tools and the human use of rationality to enhance their own power. Thus, force is at the basis of civil society, which is not governed by the law of nature, which is pity, which is why only force can undo the unequal force that civil society employs. Until this issue is redressed, no society, according to Rousseau, is legitimate. Until we become independent of each other once again, we will never be free and equal. Rousseau was indispensable for providing the intellectual groundwork for the Jacobins during the French Revolution who revered him as a prophet. And here in the second discourse 
on inequality, we see Rousseau's seductive story of how inequality and political oppression came to be. Through the use of human reason, tools, and science, man creates private property for himself to enjoy leisure at the expense of others. Men who are intelligent and strong use their intelligence and strength to enslave others to serve them. This results in the creation of civil society and its laws, which are created to protect the strong, the powerful, and the intelligent at the expense of the majority. Once we come to understand that this is the reality of civil society and that we are miserable in the company of others, the revolution of force to overthrow civil society becomes necessary if we are to regain our freedom and equality, which is fundamentally about our separation from others. We do not want to have relationships with other human beings, but when we encounter them, we encounter them with pity and move on and live our own individualistic lives. The irony of Rousseau's discourses on inequality is that he promotes a radical form of atomistic individualism that can only come about through the collective use of tyrannical force and revolution. And we might say that Rousseau's vision is still very much alive and well in the 21st century.